I gave you a hard copy of, of the syllabus as well, as well, along with the schedule. So this semester, the first part of the lab class is learning spectroscopy. Now, many places do this in the lecture class. We'll have enough stuff in lecture to worry about. Um, so we put the spectroscopy in the in here. And instead of doing like one hour lectures the entire time, which would be two hour lectures in, in the summer, um, we're just going to go ahead and front load it. So you also have then today's the first two set, the first set and a half of notes for spectroscopy. There'll be problems, one set of IR problems that you have, you're going to do um, here as practice, and then the other ones are going to be handed in. So I'll I'll put I'll make sure that's there. Um, and so right now the What did I load? Apparently I loaded the wrong. Instead of loading summer, I loaded. So I'll, re, I'll redo these, but and I have to do the deadlines on here. So disregard what's sort of on, online right at the moment. Other than the PowerPoints, I'll replace the lecture videos that are on here with, other, with, this, with these lecture videos. Is it on? I thought it was published. Let's see. I thought I published it. Well, that's why. So now it's published, so now you can see it. But there's nothing to see right at the moment. Okay. We're doing, and we're going to do, basically, there'll be three lab reports this semester. Three. Because here's, because what we're going to do is, after we're done with spectroscopy, we're going to do one week of Diels-Alder all, all reaction. Um, and then, so we learn spectroscopy so we can analyze our products. Then what we're going to do is, then we're going to do, um, a multi-step reaction to make benzocaine. So it's basically we make this compound today, and then in the next lab period we convert that to something else, and then we convert that to something else. So it's a four-step process to get to the benzocaine, which is an ingredient in sunscreen. So each week when we make our compound, we're gonna do an NMR to determine its purity, make sure it's the stuff we want, and then um, we also do a multi-week experiment where you're going to be given a bottle of a carboxylic acid and an alcohol and then you're going to add acid to that and reflux it which you haven't done yet but reflux basically means take the round bottom put a condenser on top of it and then you're going to boil that for a couple of hours in order to make an ester and then you're going to have to figure out what ester you make so we're going to do that we have to purify etc so that's a multi-step week. So there's one week experiment and then two multi-week experiments. And multi-week means here multi-day. Okay. So that's why there's only three lab reports. But you'll have to keep track of stuff as you go along because you're going to be combining each week's and two. And we'll still be collecting up notebooks, notebook pages. So we're going to, so, and we may do, we might do, we might change those procedures a little bit because I do have an, I do have the engineer coming in tomorrow to, to upgrade my microwave, not this microwave, like a 40 grand microwave that I would have, that I got for one third the price. So if we do that, then we might be able to take our samples, put them in the smaller test tubes, and do the reaction in a few minutes, and that'll save energy and make it more green, make it more environmentally friendly. But that's what most that's what pharmaceutical companies use to do their reactions. So it's called a focus microwave. He just called me at lunchtime and said he's coming in tomorrow to fix it. So 
we may, might even be able to do reactions in water. So we may, I may change those procedures a little bit depending on how much time I get, which is going to be none. So, okay. So here's what we're going. Here's what we're going to talk about first. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background, um, and then we're going to, then we'll talk about the nuts and bolts of three of the techniques. So you don't have to worry about the reading assignment from the Wade textbook, although I did open up chapters blank and blank in your top hat book that will have the IR, the mass spec, and the NMR. So there is gonna, you can use that as a resource and there's probably problems there. I'm not gonna assign you any of the problems, although I should, but I'll have my own written problems that we're gonna do. So the idea is we'll do those in class and then we'll have some as, t as homework assignments. So the first thing is, We're going to spend time talking about we're going to spend time talking about spectroscopy. So the question is, what is spectroscopy? What's organic spectroscopy? So we've talked about a lot of different reactions in the first class as well as today. So for instance, how, does, how did Markovnikov know that the hydrogen added to the carbon with the most hydrogens? How did Saitsev know that he got the more stable double bond instead of the less stable double bond? Which means, how did these people in the late 1800s, early 1900s know what product they had? And what they had to do was they had to do a whole bunch of series of sort of chemical tests. For instance, we learned today that if I take bromine and add it to a double bond, I'll add two bromines trans, right? Well, bromine is an orange liquid. So if I put a drop of my orange liquid bromine into the solution and that orange liquid immediately disappears, I know I have a double or a triple bond. I have, know I have something in my molecule some functional group that reacts immediately with bromine. If it didn't react and I put it in the sunlight and it did, that would be a free radical halogenation reaction that we're going to get to this semester. Um, that's probably the only reactions we've talked about now with distinct color changes. But we'll talk about more, more as we go along this week in lecture. So there were color tests that you could do to determine functional groups. And then if you had an authentic molecule that somebody knew what it was, you could always compare the melting point, the boiling point, the mixed melting point, etc. But nowadays, we have to use spectroscopy to determine a, a, the structure of a molecule because there are some really complicated molecules that we can get from natural sources that might be good anti-tumor drugs. And so if we get this drug that we get from some sea urchin, that we find in some coral reef in Hawaii. And if we do find a sea urchin in the coral reef in Hawaii, it's not gonna be very good for the sea urchin because we're gonna to have to blend it up to find all of those anti-tumor drugs. So the sea urchin's gonna make a sacrifice. Um, not willingly, probably. But we're gonna take those compounds and we're gonna see, okay, which ones of these have anti-tumor activities? And then we'd narrow it down to a specific compound, but we've got to figure out what its structure is. Because we can't kill sea urchins to cure cancer. There's not enough of them. And I'll show you another example. But we need to be able to synthesize that. So how do we know what the structure is to begin with? So that's what spectroscopy does. And it's a series of techniques that are all complementary. So here's a good, here's a good example, non-sea urchin example. So this is the drug Taxol. And when I first started teaching 27 years ago, Taxol was just entering clinical trials. Now it's used for things like ovarian cancer, and it's probably used for a number of, of these drugs. But this compound came from 
the bark of the California yew tree, which grows in Oregon. I don't know why it's the California yew tree, but anyway, it's a little scrubby tree. Nobody really cared about it. Places like National Institutes of Health had a program to isolate anti-tumor molecules from natural sources. So somebody took the bark off this tree, found out it had an anti-tumor activity, and then began separating all the components out until they got it down to one, which was this molecule, Taxol. Now, there's a lot of chiral centers there. There's huge rings. Um, how did they know what the structure was? And the way that they determined the structure for Taxol, because I happen to have worked with a professor at Duke when I was in graduate school who actually did the Taxol structure determination, is they used x-ray crystallography. Now I'm just going to show you this because anytime you open up a biology book and you see the picture of DNA obviously or you see um, pictures of proteins, they all come from this technique. We're never going to do this technique because I don't have that instrument here. But as a postdoc I did this for two years. So if you want to know, if somebody just walks up to you and says, hey, I got this, figure out what the structure is. The most accurate way of doing it is to try and grow a little crystal. So you try and grow a perfect crystal out of that material, and then you can pass an x-ray beam through it. So maybe the big one is a little bit more perfect than the one on top, because I see it's got a little bite out of the corner. That might work, and it, it, it may. So the idea is we have to crystallize these things very slowly, you know, like you did last semester with the triboluminescent crystals, except yours were never of this quality, right? So sometimes you have to let them sit months before they crystallize into a perfect shape. You look at them under the microscope, they have to be clear through. They can't be like two shoe boxes, not quite perfectly on top of each other, but a little bit skewed. They have to be perfect crystals. And for a while, they were growing crystals on, in the space station on the shuttle to try and figure out if you could grow crystals better in an anti-gravity environment. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure that they ever had tremendous success with that. But if you can get a nice single crystal then, you pass an x-ray beam through it and the crystal diffracts the beam into all these little beams on the side here where it's showing you um, they have a particular intensity and a three-dimensional sort of direction. And then if you use a lot of equations, you can put that structure, those beams, put them back together and determine the exact structure of the molecule. So you get a crystal for, for biocrystals, they're usually on the order of tenths of millimeters, which is really small. When we used to do them, we used to be able to do millimeter-sized um, crystals, but they weren't more than a millimeter or two. We would put them on the end of a very small fiber, which was about, which is there. And then once we put them on the fiber, then the x-ray beam would come through and react. And so you would end up with a structure that looks well, this is one of the structures we did. It's actually one of the structures we did here and then sent the crystals down to Youngstown State. So then you get the exact positions of the carbon atoms. So for instance, here is a benzene ring and you can see a nice flatness of benzene ring. Over here, we've got a carbon-carbon double bond. Um, here's a carbon-carbon double bond with two methyl groups off of it. And then this is actually a double bond. This is a molecule called an enolate that we'll talk about at the end of this at the end of this class. So we can get an exact picture of the molecule and know its exact structure. And if you get a good enough crystal, this is how you actually determine whether something is R or S. And then once you determine, you take that crystal, you determine the polarimetry, whether it's D or L, put it in the X-ray diffraction determine whether it's R or S, and that's how you make those comparisons. Um, the crystallographer that I, I was not a crystallographer in graduate school, but I had some crystals that needed to be done, so 
I worked with a crystallographer who was an old Scottish guy who had actually worked with the original people that came up with crystallography in Scotland. And so he was amused by the fact that I was, as an organic chemist, I was going to go do a postdoc and, at Brown in crystallography. And he's like, why are you doing that? And I go, oh, it seems interesting. So that's what we, that's what we did. And so once you have the structure, you can actually see what it looks like sort of as in the bulk. The way crystals work is, if you imagine you had a shoebox, and you put the model of your molecule inside the shoebox, if you then took shoeboxes that had the model in exactly the same position in every shoebox, and you stacked them on top of each other, that's how you make a three-dimensional crystalline, crystalline solid. But we don't normally get those here. You know, we get what looks to be nice crystals, but they might be big, but they're not perfect the way the ones I showed you. So there's a lot of work that's done on trying to get those crystals, and most of it's done with biomolecules. So anytime you see a picture like this, obviously, let's see if I've got Watson and Crick. Nope. Watson, Crick, and Dorothy Hodgkin. So they were the ones that were actually responsible for getting the crystal structure of DNA. And they did something very similar to this. They crystallized out the DNA. Nowadays, if you go to something like what's called the protein data bank, you can actually get crystals of every, you can get uh, structures of everything. Pull them into the computer and look at their structure. A lot of drug discoveries done this way. Because if you think this enzyme is responsible for something, you want to see if you can put a molecule inside that enzyme and kill it or enhance its activity. So where do you go? You try and get a structure of it. So when you, when you see these kinds of structures, including all the ribbons and stuff, because the ribbons are just cute representations of the actual atoms. Right? If you've ever seen the ribbons that sort of they have arrows on them, and those are just a representation of the actual three-dimensional structure. 99.5% of those is always, are always going to be x-ray structures. So if you take biochemistry or genetics, you're going to see a lot of those. But they all come from x-ray crystallography, which is great. If you have the instrument, you know how to do it, then you just grow your little crystal and get your structure. However, what happens if something's a liquid? What happens if something's an oil? How do you get the, th how do you get the structure of that? What if somebody just walks up to you on the street and says, here, here's this powder, tell me what it is. Now, nobody's going to do that, but I have done consulting for companies where they literally have done that to me, where they've said, can you, tell, can you tell us what this is? And so I have to use a combination of techniques in order to do that. And then I send them a bill. So, and, it, it's, and it's all sorts of stuff sometimes. So what we're going to do is we're going to use complementary techniques. In other words, this, one technique gives us this information, another technique gives us another set of information. And we can use these on anywhere from 10, down, 10 to 100 milligrams of sample. And it can be either a liquid or a solid. Tep typically, it has to be a low molecular weight material. Um, and low molecular weight means probably 250,000 or lower. So these are the techniques that we're going to use. And so I don't know if we're going to talk much about ultraviolet spectroscopy, um, but we'll get to conjugated alkenes and aromatic systems in lecture. We're going to talk today about infrared. So infrared is used to identify the functional groups. So if somebody walked up to you with a liquid and said, hey, I want to know if this is an alcohol, it'll take 10 seconds on the IR, and you can tell whether it's an alcohol or not. Now, in the old days, what you had to do is you had to sort of check solubility, drop a tiny piece of sodium metal into it, and make sure it didn't explode but fizzed, which would tell you it was an alcohol. 
It wouldn't tell you what kind of alcohol it was. From infrared, I can at least tell it's an alcohol. And even then, if I use NMR, I can tell you the exact alcohol it is. And then also mass spectrometry comes into play. So mass spectrometry, you see a lot on CSI and other detective and, and like C, like on NCIS. There was, they have a, it's, I think it's called major mass spec is what they call it. Because it solves every crime except DNA. So on TV, you know, they're like, oh, that's what it is. We have this. It doesn't work that way, and we're going to see it, although it kind of works that way. But it's, it's a lot slower process, and if I have a brand new compound that's never been made, then mass spectrometry is a little bit harder than what it looks like on TV. And then finally, we're going to spend a number of days on nuclear magnetic resonance. So NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, that's the big magnet that's in the instrument room, fenced off. Um, and we'll talk about that here in a couple, I think Thursday. We'll start talking about it. Well, actually, we'll start talking about it on Wednesday. So you put all these techniques together, and you can determine the structure of pretty much everything, even if it's completely unknown and it's never been made before. So in terms of drug discovery, this is huge. Because if you can't get a crystal, then you need to verify your structure by using NMR. And so it's by NMR mass spec. So in a forensic lab, most forensic labs don't have an NMR, but there are some that do. Um, our engineer that comes in and fills the magnets always telling me about his escapades when he goes to one of the um, like FBI labs that has one because then they have to like he has to be buzzed in and wanted and the whole nine yards um, but not very many people have one of have an NMR so in terms of all these techniques with the exception of mass spectrometry they all have in common that they are elect they use electromagnetic radiation so we go back to general chemistry and think, OK, what's electromagnetic radiation? It's light. What kind of light? Going to depend on the technique. So what we're going to use is we're going to use infrared, and we're going to use radio waves, and we could use visible light if we were measuring the intensity of a solution. You may have done that in general chemistry. If you ever made a concentration versus absorbance plot, you're using visible light. Beer's law. You're using, you're using visible light. Um, and it, UV, maybe when we make our sunscreen, we'll see how, we'll test it and see how it, how it works. Not by putting it on our skin and going out into the sun, but by shining some UV light on it and seeing if it really blocks the light or not. So infrared and radio waves are the ones that we are going to use the most. Mass spectrometry is a different, it doesn't use light. So what's the basis? The basis for this technique is I have a molecule sitting in a ground state. Somehow it gets excited and goes up into the excited state. Now, that can happen thermally by the absorption of kinetic energy, um, or could observe by the or could happen by the absorbance of light. But there is a very distinct energy difference between the ground state and the excited state. And it's a very exact energy. And from general chemistry, remember that the energy, the, the energy is, delta energy is different, is equal to H times nu. That's the actual energy of a photon of light. Now, a photon of light doesn't mean that I can see it. 
Radio wave is electromagnetic radiation, as is um, infrared that we can't see with our eyes. So all of, all of those um, are light, and so we can tell the energy of that photon of light um, by measuring the delta energy. If we know the energy gap between excited and ground state, we know exactly what wavelength or what frequency of light will cause that molecule to either go into the excited state or when it relaxes down into the ground state, it might give off a particular wavelength of light. So that's the critical part. Depending on the energy gap, we might have um, wavelengths in the infrared or we might have wavelengths in the um, radio frequencies. So we're either going to excite the molecule into, or excite the molecule from the ground state, or we're going to watch whatever light it gives off. And so that's the basics. Because it's light, we can easily convert very accurate energies into light. So then we need to make a, spe a spectrometer. In general chemistry, you've done, you've taken solutions and diluted them down into, so that they have different color intensities and measured their intensity and then plotted concentration versus time. So you probably use some sort of spectrometer, maybe real sophisticated. It may have been those little tiny ones that attach to the computers, which is what we have here. Um, here's how we make one. We take a light source. And all light sources, unless it's a laser, are going to have a broad variety of, of wavelengths. You're going to pass that through a prism, which is then going to separate out the various wavelengths of light. You could also use a grating, a grating instead of a prism. So easiest, the easiest place to see a grating is if you have CDs or a CD. If you take the CD and hold it up to the light and then kind of, you know, move it back and forth, you'll see the colors. Usually you'll see the rainbow colors, the Roy G. Biv colors. But if you move, if you use that as your material, as your source, you can actually separate the wavelengths of light and pass them through the sample. So we need something to separate the light into individual wavelengths. We're going to pass it through the sample and then we've got our detector to measure how much light made it through the sample. So we're also measuring then how much light is not going, is going through no sample. So that's in general chemistry that would be called the blank. Right. Not the blank is in what the name is, the blank is in that's the blank solution that has everything but the electric, but the analyte. So that's how we make a simple spectrophotometer. We're going to separate the light out, and then we're going to pass that those wavelengths of light through the sample. Now, when you've measured the intensity of the light before, you were measuring at a particular wavelength, right? You would dial in the wavelength, or you'd click it in. What we're going to do for organic molecules is we're going to scan through the wavelengths. So as we scan through the wavelengths, we're going to see the absorbance of the sample go up and make a peak. Some peaks are going to be really broad. Some peaks are going to be really narrow. That peak is going to tell us a lot of information. The position of that peak on this x-axis a lot of times correlates to the functional group. Sometimes the area you know, underneath the peak is proportional to the number of hydrogens or carbons that's in the sample. But what we're going to do is we're going to scan. So unless you had a scanning spectrophotometer in your general chem class, which you very well may have had, we normally don't scan. We just measure at a fixed wavelength. But here we're going to have to scan because that position of the peak is going to tell us a lot of information. Okay. So. The first technique, which was of the techniques we're going to talk about, it was the first 
that was developed. Um, commercial instruments, I think, for infrared spectroscopy became available back in the 1950s is when a lot is when they were commercially available and you could buy one. So it's been around a while. Its primary use has changed through the years, and I'll talk about that a little bit because um, we're only going to spend, you know, we're only we're going to spend a very small time on this because it's not it's not the most powerful technique, although in forensics it is, and I'll I'll, I'll go into that. So. Infrared radiation um, has a wavelength from 2.5 times 10 to the minus third to 2.5 times 10 to the fourth centimeters. First of all, normally when you've talked about wavelengths in the past, you've talked about nanometers. So centimeters is a unique unit, but this is organic chemistry, so nobody follows the rules. So we do everything in centimeters. Actually, we don't do everything in centimeters. We do everything in reciprocal centimeters. So we take one over the wavelength, and we call that the wave number. And the reason for that is just probably simplicity. We can have a scale that'll go from 400 to 4,000. And then we just remember those numbers of where peaks show up. So how do molecules absorb infrared radiation? I'm going to talk about the mechanisms for each of these techniques because that's what we're using to analyze. So if you think of two atoms that are attached, those two atoms are always vibrating. Bonds are always vibrating. If two atoms are vibrating, they're always vibrating back and forth. If you have something like a water molecule, a water molecule, we have oxygen and your two hydrogens, then they're moving like this as well. That's a vibration. So both the bond angles are vibrating as well as the bond themselves, the, bo the bonds between the two atoms. There's a vibrational frequency there. So you can kind of think of that as a, as a spring. But the critical part is that those vibrations, whether they're bonds vibrating sort of in and out, or whether they're atoms, two atoms vibrating within their bond length, those frequencies are all within the infrared region. So, you know, where do you see infrared lights? Well, I suppose you go to a fast food restaurant, the infrared lights are keeping the food warm. How are they doing that? Well, the water that's in the food is going to be absorbing that infrared radiation, keeping it warm. If you go to different hotels, sometimes they'll have an infrared light above the outside of the shower, so when you get out, you can turn it on, and instantly you feel the warmth of that light. So water is a huge absorber of infrared radiation. And so are organic molecules, which is what we're going to talk about. So when we talk about infrared radiation then, we're going to be looking at these frequencies of these bonds going back and forth, and we're also going to look at how they sort of wag. And that's going to give us the particular frequency that we're going to look for. And I won't go into the, how a spectrophotometer works, because we don't have spectrophotometers that work that way. They all use Fourier transform mathematics which we're not going to get into. But we are going to get into functional groups and where their characteristic peaks show up. So if you look at an alkane, we're going to start with alkanes and work our way up. If you have an alkane like hexane and you look at its infrared here, 
if you look at its infrared um, peaks, you'll see that there really aren't a whole lot for hexane. Now, where are they, though? There are peaks below 3,000, so just a little bit below 3,000 reciprocal centimeters or wave numbers. And those are pretty much the ones that we're going to look at. So when I take an infrared spectrum of a molecule and I see peaks below 3,000, it tells me I have alkanes. I've got sp3 hybridized CH bonds. And if you get all excited about that and say, oh, that's great, remember, organic molecules are nothing more than functional groups hung off of an alkane skeleton. So seeing these peaks isn't going to be all that helpful. Now not seeing those peaks is a whole other story. Because then you say, well wait, I have a molecule with no alkanes in it. That's pretty unique. So helpful, but not helpful at the same time. So that's where the alkanes show up. You might say, what, what are these? What are these peaks? Those are different frequencies, which I'll go back. I think I have the program on this computer to show you how all these things vibrate. So carbon-hydrogen bonds, sp3 hybridized carbon-hydrogen bonds, occur just a little bit below 3,000. And I like to read these from left to right. So when I see peaks below 3,000, I'm like, alkane. And then I'm like, OK, I need more information. Alkenes, just put a double bond in the molecule, and all of a sudden what you see is, you see a peak above 3,000. 3,000 is kind of an important line. So when you see peaks below 3,000, alkanes, or sp3 hybridized CH bonds, when you see them above 3,000, now those are hydrogens attached to a double bonded carbon. So an sp2 hybridized carbon. So when they're below 3,000 or when they're above 3,000, that tells you you have an H attached to a C with a double bond. Is it a normal double bond, or is it an, or could it be an aromatic ring, which we'll find out has carbon has carbon carbon double bonds in the six membered ring. I don't know. It could be one or the other. So a molecule that's made up of benzene, benzene-like molecules will show up above 3,000. Alkanes will show up below 3,000. And so whether it's, an alkane, al, whether it's an alkene or an aromatic compound, which is what the benzene ring signifies, I don't know. I'm going to have to find that out. It'll, you also see peaks around 1640 to 1680, which would be this peak right here. That peak is the CC bond, the CC double bond, stretching. So notice the intensities on these peaks vary. Peaks that are really strong are going to have an absorbance all the way to the bottom, and that's what I, and I forgot to mention this. When I'm looking at these peaks, I'm looking at upside down peaks. Right? When I drew the absorbance before, I said the peak went up. Again, organic chemists developed IR, and they decided to have the peaks upside down. Do we put them right side up? Yeah, I don't. I'm just used to having them reverse. So the farther down on the scale the peak goes, the stronger the peak. So I would consider those two peaks pretty medium. Something like this might be weak. So when you have alkenes, again, they're going to they're gonna show a peak above 3,000. I don't normally look for this peak, but if I thought I had a carbon-carbon double bond, I might look for that one. That peak is not going to be there, actually, with a benzene ring. It's going to be in a different place. <coughs> triple bonds. So a triple bond, then... It depends on what kind of triple bond you have. 
because you can have a triple bond with a hydrogen at the end of it or you can have a triple bond with no hydrogen. This would be called an internal triple bond and this would be a terminal. And you'll see that for lecture tomorrow. Terminal have an H at the end of the chain, internals don't. So you can actually, if somebody gave me an alkyne and said, I don't know if this is an internal or a terminal, I'd walk it over to the IR, I'd take a spectrum, and if I saw a CH peak at about 3300, a nice sharp peak, I'd go, well, that's, an inter that's a terminal alkyne. If I didn't see that peak, then it would be an internal alkyne. Now I'm also looking for this very distinct peak there. That's the indication of the triple bond stretching. So we can look for the CC stretch or we can look for the CH stretch. And if I see the CC stretch with no CH stretch, I've got an internal triple bond. Now, I do not as much now since they closed their two big plants. But I was doing some consulting work for a major Northeast Ohio bread company. And what would happen is they would find contaminants in their bread and then they would send them to me to figure out what they were. And, you know, if it's, like the, it's like the food channel, right? You've got these machines baking, slicing, bagging bread by the, you know, one every second. And so they would find various things. I mean, I went to the plant one time. There were two hot dog um, two containers of hot dogs, buns, slapped up on the bulletin board with those blue gloves on the inside of it. With the question like, how did these blue gloves get inside of the hot dog buns? And they were clearly just hanging out there in the, in the package. So fortunately, the person at whatever store you know, they find that and they immediately set it aside and send it back to the company. And then the company's got to figure out who dropped their, who dropped their, you know, late to, or their um, nitrile gloves in the hot dog buns, which isn't my problem. My problem is if they sent me a little, that if I got a little blue or purple piece of, um, found something like that in a piece of bread, and they said, what is this? I'd have to figure out, first thing I would look at is I would, well, they would look at it and they go, that looks like the gloves that we use. And then they would say, can you, you know, prove that? And so then I would take the little piece of blue and I would take an infrared on it. Now nitriles, nitrile groups are a C triple bond N group. And so a C triple bond N group has that same sharp P a little bit to the left or right, but it's a very distinct peak. So I would go ahead and I would take an infrared of it, and if I saw that peak, then I would go, yep, that's a piece of somebody's nitrile glove. And then I would charge the money and write a report and take pictures of it. But that company doesn't, that company I think has used, I think I've solved every mystery for them. So when their people go and work for a new bread company, then I get to start all over again. They're sending me the same things they did before. Never had a blue glove in there. Nothing that easy. But if I did, that's how you can tell that something's nitrile, is by looking at that. Versus, let's say, latex, which would not have a C-triple bond in. So you can tell the difference in these materials by looking for those characteristic peaks. So that's a carbon-carbon triple bond. Here's my nitrile. My nitrile's at 2250. So that's heptyl cyanide, which again, it just has a C triple bond in. 
whether it's a cyanide is a harsh word, right? Because it implies death. You could handle this without death. Regular C triple bond N minus cyanide ion, death. So this one would tell me, okay, I've got a nitrile group. Then if I'm looking at the benzene ring, the benzene ring is going to have peaks above 3,000. So greater than 3,000 reciprocal centimeters is going to be my CHs that are attached to the benzene ring. But before I saw just a single peak in this region for the carbon-carbon double bond, it's not uncommon to see this pattern of three or four peaks in that region that kind of tell you that you have a benzene ring versus a normal nor a normal carbon carbon bond. So when you see that, you might say, I think there's a benzene ring in there. And then there's some characteristic peaks down here, and we'll talk about what that means in, in a few minutes. So let's go on the oxygen and nitrogen-containing functional groups. Alcohol. How do you know you have an alcohol? Well, you know you have an alcohol because there's this huge, distinctive, broad, large, strong, broad peak between 33 and 3,500 wave numbers. That is the characteristic that you either have a water or an alcohol in your product. And so this is the OH stretch. So your OH bond is vibrating because that's an O and an H with a different atomic weight. It's going to have a different frequency. We still have peaks below 3000 because this is just an alkane. If I had an OH peak with peaks above 3000, I'd be looking for a molecule with an OH and double bonds. Okay. So that's, that's characteristic of an OH. So whenever I look at a spectrum, the first thing I do is I look for, I read it from left to right, I'm looking for OH. And if I see it, it's an alcohol. Now, here's the problem with IR. The problem with IR is that almost every alcohol has that same broad peak. Whether it's methanol with one carbon, ethanol with two, or a hundred carbon chain, they're all going to have that OH peak in about that position. And since it's broad, they're all going to be the same. So I can determine that your molecule is an alcohol, I just can't tell you which one it is. So this is where IR kind of has a limited use. but it's still useful because if you wanted to know something was an alcohol, that's how you would measure it. Or that's how you would determine it. How about nitrogens? Well, if you have an NH2 molecule, first of all, that's a peak between 33 and 3500. And you might say, well, how do I know it's an, it's an amine with a nitrogen? versus an alcohol is an OH, they have vastly different strengths. So the NH is much weaker than the OH. Plus, when you have an NH2, you see two peaks. So this is an NH2 that's attached. Why? Here's the N, I, here's the N, here's my two H's. Okay, there's two ways that they can vibrate. They can be symmetrical, or they can be unsymmetrical. Each one of those is going to have a slightly different frequency, and so you're going to see those two peaks. So if you have a, what you think is an amine, you can tell that this one is what's called a primary amine, because the nitrogen has to be attached to a, it's only attached to one carbon, so it's primary. If I take away one hydrogen, I only have one peak because there's no symmetrical or anti-symmetrical. So when you have uh, 
primary amine, like in NH2, you have two peaks. When you have a um, single amine, if you have an NH, then that means you're going to have just one peak. And if you have an N with no hydrogens on it, no peak. It won't show up. Carbonyls. This is another limitation of another limitation of, of um, IR. There's a bunch of different carbonyl compounds. Um, this one is a ketone. So when you have two alkyl groups attached to the to the carbonyl, and the carbonyl is a C double bond O. So when you have a carbonyl compound, you have two R groups attached to it, it's a ketone. Notice that's a ketone with no Y. So you have a ketone. Acetone is a ketone. So when you have a ketone, then the CO double bond stretch, that vibration is very distinctive. It'll occur anywhere from 16 to 1800. So this peak right here is the C double bond O stretch for a ketone. And you could look at that and you could say, oh, well, that's about, I don't know, it's a little bit more than 1700 nanometers, or 1700 wave numbers. So, Carbonyl stretches are in about the same position, regardless of what kind of carbonyl it is. So we're not going to be able to make a distinction between a ketone and aldehyde, an ester, And as far as the ketone goes, a carboxylic acid. And I'm now realizing we didn't go through the functional groups in the first semester lecture class. So those are the different carbonyls that we could have. Ketones, aldehydes, esters, carboxylic acids. Oh. And amides. So the, there, there are books. There are books that will tell you um, what what the what the different peak um, positions are between sixteen and eighteen hundred. Aldehydes tend to be here. Ketones tend to be here. Um, amides tend to be here, but we're not actually, um, we're not going to go into that much depth. There is occasional, there is occasion when you need to go into that much depth. This is probably not one of those times. So when you see a peak between 16 and 1800, you're going to say, oh, that's a carbonyl. Do I know what kind? No. So, and, and if you get into protein chemistry, there are some very specific bands that show up between those 16 and 1800. The reason I know that is because they found an object in the bread, they sent it to me, it went through every person that touched it had to write down on the piece of paper what they thought it was. So it's like, it's a fingernail, it's a tooth, it's a, a bone. I smelled it. It, I think it's a fingernail. Can't take that to court, right? Can't say, oh, it's a fingernail because I smelled it and I think it's a fingernail. In infrared, a tooth. At, oh, is a tooth. It looks like a tooth. Actually, the coat, the outer coating on your teeth, 
have a very distinctive IR, so I can rule out teeth immediately. You might say, where did you get the authentic tooth? Um, I think I had some leftover from a science fair project. A student who was putting mercury fillings in teeth and measuring the mercury that leached out into different, I think she left me a tooth. An intact tooth, which means somebody had to yank it, pull it out. So teeth, it's very easy to determine if something's a tooth or not because the coating is very distinctive. Um, fingernails are made up of proteins, which means I'd see a CO double bond. I'd see a CO double bond stretch because proteins are made of amides. There was a piece of glass. There really isn't much infrared absorption to a piece of glass. It's a piece of ceramic, same thing. Not much. I think the last one I got, they thought some, apparently somebody had bitten into the bread and they thought they lost a tooth. So they're, or they thought they lost a tooth. And like, it's not, it's not a tooth. And like, it's not a fingernail. It's a piece of glass. They didn't believe me. They're like, well, we think it's a filling. So I went to a dentist who made them a couple of fillings, sent it back to me. Here's some fillings, test them, okay? Test as much as you want, 180 bucks a piece. Plus, plus report time, one hour minimum. And so they sent me back some, some of those and they kind of looked, the IR kind of looked like glass, but not exactly the same. I'm like, nope, that's a piece of glass. It's a piece of glass that's sort of um, cream color. It's not, this fill, it's not these fillings, it's a piece of glass. I think they ended up there. I think that probably proved to the person that it was a piece of glass. Again, not my concern how the glass got in there. My concern, it's a piece of glass. You know, this keeps me from being sued. Although people have gotten my name and yelled at me about stuff. Like if you don't bake the bread to 210 degrees for so many minutes, you don't kill the yeast. You get live yeast in a in a pack. If you ever open up a bread and it smells like fingernail polish, there's live yeast in there. Don't eat it. And if you eat it, then you deserve the tummy troubles you're going to have. But that's what somebody was. They're like, they told me that this didn't, that this didn't, uh, that eating this wouldn't be harmful. And I'm like, sir. In my report, you'll see that this lab does not dispense medical information. I'm not going to tell you that it's safe to eat that bread. Then the plant manager's like, I've eaten the bread before, I'm fine. I'm like, that's you, you can get sued, not me. I'm not getting sued over this. But yes, were there live yeast in there? Oh, yes. Does it smell like fingernail polish? Yes, because the yeast take the nutrients from the bread and they make ethyl acetate out of it. And what's ethyl acetate in? Fingernail polish remover. So I'm like, why did she think that? Because there was ethyl acetate in there. How did I determine that? Mass spectrometry. So, you know, there's all sorts of these things that happened. Not as much now that everybody's moved on to other companies, but still. Which gets me to, how is infrared used in the forensic lab? Well, basically, the entire spectrum is a fingerprint, right? If you get this peak of this intensity at this particular wavelength, you can make those numbers and basically make a numerical fingerprint for that molecule. And you can compare one spectrum to another one mathematically. You could overlay them too, but mathematically, you can compare them and determine how much of a fit it is. So for instance, when they sent me the ceramic ceramic fillings, I'm like, this is only a 60% match to glass. It's not, that's not high enough to say that they're the same material. This glass piece that I have here, it's a 98% match to a piece of glass. So it's glass. But you can end up actually comparing two spectra and determining how much of a match it is. Now, go out and buy a database that has 150, 200,000 spectra in it, and you now have a database to compare 
your spectra to the database and it'll come back and say, oh, these are your possible matches. And that's how on TV, they, you don't see much you don't see much IR analysis on TV, but when they talk about that fiber right there was in your car, you know, we found a fiber of yours. How did they know it was your fiber? They actually took that fiber and did an infrared analysis on it and compared the spectrum of that fiber to whatever one they found on your clothes and said, oh, that's a match. Now I have to use a microscope and I'd love to have a, an FTIR microscope um, so that you can get really small. You can do it with paint chips. You can slice them so that you can look at the interior to determine what the specific um, components are. In a car paint, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have your, your um, first coat, then your, then your paint, then you're going to have a clear coat on top of that so you can determine, you know, pretty much the make of car it comes from, particularly people who work in the forensic labs because they have to, they get all that information from car manufacturers. So is it out of the realm of possibility if they had a paint chip they could match to a car? No, that actually can be done. Can they match to an unknown paint color? No, because they need an authentic to work with. So infrared then, the entire spectrum could be thought of as fingerprint, but the region between like 1400 on down, that's called the fingerprint region because that's what we oftentimes use to match. Those peaks are unique. So again, if I had a database and I had a molecule, if I had a plastics database, which I have made myself, then I can go to that, match them up, and say, oh, this is a piece of low density polyethylene. So that's, that's how we use the infrareds. What's the other, what's the other good example? The other good example was there was the, there was the AstroTurf scare of like, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Most places don't have, most places have AstroTurf on their soccer slash football fields. We do here. So in New Jersey, there was a football field next to a smelting plant. And so the EPA of New Jersey went into that football field and they took samples from the AstroTurf thinking that there would be metals there that were coming from the smelting plant. And what they found was that sure enough, there were metals there. But before they went and, you know, decided to destroy the smelting plant, they washed all of the AstroTurf cliffings and measured the metals concentration again and found out that the metals were part of the AstroTurf, mostly because of the pigment that turns it green or white or, or whatever color. So it wasn't the smelting plant fault that there was metals on that field, it was the manufacturer of the AstroTurf. And it was a pretty high concentration of lead that if, the, if it broke down into powder form, you could actually be breathing it in. And lead poisoning is bad. So I mean, it would be no different than finding an old house with lead paint in it. So then, the, then they decided, okay, well, let's find out what kind of what kind of field it is, and it turned out it was a nylon field versus a polyethylene field. So first time it came through, I think RAD wasn't all that excited about it, but then the president read about the fact that fields were turning up with lead, and so then he called the AD and said, does our field have lead? And then they said, I don't know, so then they called the chemistry department and usually get me. And they said, can you test our AstroTurf for lead? And at the time, I could. So then I went over, I got all this, still have the AstroTurf in the, in the lab, pulled up some AstroTurf, reacted with acid, measured it for lead. There was no lead. But before I even did that, 
I put it on the IR because if it has nylon, it's going to have a C double bond O N because that's an amide, that's polyamide. If it was just polyethylene, it would just have nothing but CH2s attached in a long chain and the spectrum would be boring. So I'm like, well, this is a polyethylene field, so it's not likely you're going to have lead because they were finding lead only in the nylon ones. So we dodged a bullet there because, but there's a lot of this analysis that goes on in forensic chemistry, or I guess forensic science. But that, you know, infrared is pretty powerful in that area. Unfortunately for us, it's not going to be as powerful. So here's our list. And you'll get this table for the final exam. You'll get this table um, for any quizzes. So I like to read them from left to right. Alcohols show up between 32 and 3600. And they have a strong, they're strong peaks. The OH of an acid is a little bit different. I'll have to show you what that looks like. I'll sketch that out. Then an NH is about 3,100, but again, it's, it's a weaker peak for nitrogen. Double bonded carbons that are attached to H's, the CH bond is between, is a little bit above 3,000. Alkane CH's are a little bit below 3,000, and carbonyls are from 16 to 1,800. Okay. Now, Why is this important? Because I can use this as an initial screen. I mean, infrared spectrometers came out in the 50s. They were just a godsend when they came out because now I could get information in like 10 minutes instead of four days in the lab. So tell me about this spectrum. Tell me about this molecule. It's got a broad peak, so what does that mean? So there's an OH in this molecule. Okay. Any double bonds? No double bonds because there's no peaks above. So there's no CC double bonds because there's no peak above 3,000. So there are peaks below 33,000, so there's alkane peaks. But again, remember, just because there's alkane peaks, so on. Because everything is expected to have alkane peaks. But we don't have any alkenes, we do have alkanes. Because remember, that carbon, carbon, carbon single bond skeleton is what we hang functional groups off of to make our molecules. Any carbonyl? 16 to 1800. No carbonyl. So what does that tell me? It actually tells me a lot of information. What is this? This is 2-propanol, which means 2-propanol is prop with an OH at carbon 2. If I went to the drugstore, that would be called isopropanol, propyl alcohol, which would be rubbing alcohol. How about the next one? It might have, I don't see a doublet here. I see a single peak. So it wouldn't be an NH2 if it was nitrogen. It would be an NH. So I don't know. I'd have to verify that, but it's possible. Peaks above 3,000. The peaks above 3,000 mean that this is what? Okay, 
these are alkenes, so it's either got a C double bond O, or sorry, C double bond C, or it's got a an aromatic functional group. I see some peaks below 3,000. I got some peaks below 3,000. Carbonyl. 16 to 1800 carbonyl. Yep, got some carbonyls. Up here it says it's trans 3 phenyl propene al. Which that would be the structure of trans 3 phenyl propene al. This, okay, so the circle inside the ring means it's a benzene ring. But here's where the circle comes from. Because I guess if I explain it to you, then I can use it. Because it's easier to draw. But, so here's, so the structure on the left is benzene ring, right? So benzene ring, well, right, what did I just say right? We haven't been through functional groups. It's a benzene ring. A benzene ring is a cyclohexane with alternating double and single bonds in it. There's actually two resonance structures you can draw for a benzene ring. I can draw one where the double bonds look like on the left and the ones where they look like on the right. And if I wanted to, I can interconvert those by moving this here, moving that here, moving that one there. So what happens is, is that those are two resonance structures. What would be the resonance hybrid of this? It would be partial bonds on each of the carbons. And so those partial bonds, if we simplify that by writing a circle, then that indicates the benzene ring. So a benzene ring can either have the alternating bonds or it can have a circle. I usually don't write the circle. But I will in this case, since I'm not going to do any reactions. When I do reactions on the benzene ring, I like to not draw the circle. So, infrared can tell us a lot about the molecule. If I have a database of, of molecules to search from, it can tell me a, a lot. It can tell me a whole lot because basically what I can do is if somebody hands me a what well if I'm a forensic my if I'm a forensic chemist out in the field and I have a portable IR with me that I can take the white powder I can put it on there and I can compare it to whatever illicit white powder you want to compare it to. They don't do. They don't necessarily have portable IRs to go out in the field. There's not a whole. There's not. A, governments don't have a tremendous amount of cash to spend on, you know, portable CSI vans. They just bag it, take it back to the lab, and figure it out. But a lot of screening can be done in a forensic lab with IR. Actually, a lot of screening can be done with TLC. If you take the TLC, if you think your white powder is cocaine, run a TLC against authentic cocaine. If those two peaks are close together, it could be cocaine. Those two peaks, or those two spots are far apart, it ain't cocaine. So a lot of times they do just simple screening tests on this to determine whether or not it is um, that authentic molecule. There's, there's a whole set of rules on how to determine if something is a match. So, and actually I think one of the tests you have to do is like a TLC for some reason. I 
quite sure. But you have to do one grade A level test and one grade B level test, and usually infrared matchings, like a grade B. So you need like two of those and, a, and then like a TLC. But if somebody's made something that's a derivative of cocaine and you don't know what it is, then you got to figure its structure out from scratch. And those are the places with the NMR. Except in forensic chemistry, once you figure out what you think the structure is, you then have to use literature known reactions in order to make that molecule to authenticate it. So it's a, it's a little rough. But that's how you can, but that's, but it, infrared is, infrared's used a lot in, in forensics as well as in industry and as well as, you know, we use it here for various reasons. I do have, I do have a portable IR in my, but it only measures two things. Peaks above 3,000 and peaks below 3,000. That's all it measures. And you might say, that's a, it's kind of a crappy IR. No, it just measures peaks above 3,000 and below. That's it. It doesn't measure anything else. That narrow region above 3,000 and narrow region below 3,000. So in other words, all it measures is whether the system is aromatic or aliphatic. But I think it was built for going out to the finding some sediments, like at old gas stations, and then extracting the components from the soil and determining whether or not they were just like regular gasoline without aromatic, or whether it was some sort of an oil that has aromatic in it. So that's all it does. It just tells you the difference between those two. It's tiny. But, but there are some that you can take out into the field. Okay, so. That's our infrared. Here is your assignment for, we can take a break and then you can work on it. You can work on it in groups if you'd like. So these, the, the infrared problem, you have two sets. You have two sets of infrared problems. Um, the one that says, there's one that says summer 2019, that's your homework problem. The other one that just says IR homework problem set, that has the name on it in the upper left, right, or upper right hand corner. What I'd like you to do is, you have eight spectra, and you may have nine spectra, and nine compounds. And so what I want you to do is match them up. So you're going to have a carbonyl with no ring, a carbonyl with an aromatic ring. So you're going to go through the spectra and you're going to go ahead and match those. And then when you get what you think are your correct answers, did I bring my book? Yes. So I have to, I have to check them to see whether it's correct. No, 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 we're not going to do that. We have, we have the first half of the mass technology. We probably won't go past four each day, but we will probably go to three. So you can use this as your break and then, and then look at these problems.